as I was saying, um, take a look at these three days. They're also known as the Triduum in Latin. That means three days. Um, because there are many opportunities to unfold the drama of our salvation in powerful ways. The church's proclamation of salvation in these liturgies takes place within the liturgical actions themselves. The three days encourage each of us to stretch our vision and our understanding, to see sermons in long readings, long stories well told, bowls of water, dirty feet, and broken bread and poured wine, stripped altars, silent darkness, and fire. So I want to call attention to some of these things other than the hymns and the fire, or the hymns and the sermon. The three days encourage us to pay attention to how those stories are read and how the candles are lit and how the links to the Passover and the ancient church are made. We hope that in this morning's presentation, we can encourage you in your pilgrimage, which begins a week from Sunday through Holy Week to watch and listen for some of the paradoxes and the metaphors that can bring new insights and understandings to the good news of Jesus' resurrection. We'll start with Holy Week. That term, Holy Week, can really almost be a misnomer because it tends to overemphasize the history of Jesus last week, and it blurs the distinction between the end of Lent and the beginning of the three days, which are really the focus of that Paschal mystery and Paschal season. Passion Sunday is the last Sunday of Lent because Lent ends on Holy Thursday at the time of the evening liturgy. Before we begin our pilgrimage through the liturgies of the week, we thought it might be helpful for us to reflect on the history of this week and its ties to the Jewish Passover and the early church. We will also take a look at the various environments that are created and why. Hopefully we can gain an appreciation for the way simple primary symbols of these days draw us into a richer understanding of the signs of grace. Uh, I don't know about you, but many of us were raised with kind of a medieval, sterile style of Holy Week, a ritual pattern that developed after the fourth century when Christians visited the Holy Land to try and retrace the steps of Jesus' last days. For many, in the past, Passion Sunday would be their only liturgical expression prior to Easter. And so when that happens, when you only go to church on Passion Sunday and Easter, that leaves a treasury of the church's rich liturgies untouched. On Palm Sunday, we watched as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. On Thursday, he ate with his disciples, and on Friday he died, and that was it. On Saturday we waited, and on Sunday morning, in my church back in Kansas, the men dressed up in new suits and bright ties, and the women had new outfits, and the trumpets blared, and there was just very little, um, it was easy to believe that we went from that life conquers death. And by looking only at the historical events of Jesus' last days, we're not true to a liturgy that always celebrates the fullness of the Paschal ministry. So we're going to take a look at some of these paradoxes. Carol figures out how to do that. But in recent years, decades, many Christian churches have revived a more ancient Christian observation of these days. The pattern of the first centuries was a much more paradoxical 
ritual. And you're going to hear me say that word a lot today. On Monday, on Monday, Thursday, the church gathers to eat with Christ. The food itself is Christ. Christ, the master, kneels before us to wash our feet. And we now are the body of Christ in the world and kneel before each other to wash each other's feet. On Good Friday, we read an ancient poem about a man killed as though he were a sacrificial lamb. We read not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, but which are, which are very clear on Jesus' sufferings. And they're clearly described in those three books. But we read instead in John, in which Christ strides into his passion, proclaiming his divinity to the soldiers by saying, here I am. We reverence the cross in silence as the last act of liturgy, and we call it good. Easter Vigil is a paradox at its most complete. We meet in the dark night to present Christ as the light, the flame of a single candle, as if it is brilliantly illuminating the entire room. We read four or six or 12 stories <laughs> that tell in paradoxical language the resurrection story. God created the world from chaos. God saved Noah from the flood. God rescued Israel from death. God freed the people of Israel from slavery. And as we hear this week, God put flesh on dry bones. And God stands with the three men in the fiery furnace. On that night, we're reminded the, that we are born from the wombs of our mothers and we move inexorably for tombs in the earth. Reborn in the font, the direction we move is reversed. The font is both a watery womb and a life-giving tomb. One paradox follows another. The three days are the, as I said, the triduum gives Christians their most concentrated practice of enacting the life of faith. In spite of death, we trust in God's life. Most of us need this practice for we all live through times of mysterious paradox. By this, we all know that there are times, for instance, when a pregnancy is met with dread, when death would be a blessing, when our precious children break our hearts, and when we must forgive a bitter betrayal, when we're supposed to sing an Easter hymn at the grave of our beloved. That's life. Life's not easy. But the God of the three days is a surprising, paradoxical God, a God who lived on earth, a God who chose the cross as a throne, and a God who overcame death by dying. The entry of Jesus, or the, enter, the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem marks the beginning of his passion and has been observed and celebrated by Christians since at least the fourth century. The first day of Holy Week focuses on two realities now, Christ's entry into Jerusalem and the beginning of his most intense sufferings. Many people will know this day also as Palm Sunday, as the church recalls Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem amidst a flurry of palm branches. And for many people, this Sunday will focus more on the palm branches than on the passion of Jesus. Especially among North American Lutherans, the image of the palms usurped the entire liturgy for the day 
creating Palm Sunday. It's on this day, we use the Hebrew word Hosanna a lot. And we shout it. It's derived from words meaning save we pray or help. The crowd's cry of Hosanna to the son of David at the time of Jesus' triumphant entry may have evolved into an acclamation of optimistic petition for deliverance from the tyranny of Roman rule. Today, the word continues to be used in the Sanctus of the Eucharist, where it is both a plea for help and an acclamation of the Messiah. <clears throat> Excuse me. The processional gospel at the beginning of the liturgy sets the tone of triumph, which is paradoxically undone by the reading of the full passion account later in the service. It's the first opportunity we have to hear the story of Christ's passion from beginning to end. The church's reinstatement of the reading of the passion, according to Matthew, brings the tension of the day into the liturgy itself, which does not include a sermon. For this reason, the church has renamed this Sunday to give primary attention to Christ's passion, hence Passion Sunday or slash Palm Sunday. Last Sunday, I mentioned paradox and uh, Daryl had a suggestion for what to use in the graphic. He said, just hold up two docs, paradox. <laughs> but I found this, this uh, slide online and I really, I really gravitated to it. It was done by some students at Bethany Lutheran College in um, Lindsborg, Kansas. And I think it does a good job of showing the simultaneous nature of God and man, of glorious and humble, of praised, rejected, of crown and king of thorns. So I, I, I thought that would set our tone for the triduum and this whole concept of, of uh, paradoxes and metaphors off on the right foot. Lent really has no moment of conclusion. It's over when on Maundy Thursday night, we enter into the three days or the triduum. The triduum is a single unified observance of Christ's passion and resurrection. It's been observed liturgically since the fourth century. The Lenten theme of paradox is brought to the forefront in the echo of the Passover stories that forms the backdrop for the narrative of Jesus' last days. The liberation theme of Passover, moving from slavery to freedom, is reflected in the passion story of liberation from the power of death. The Passover teachings to let go and to leave it all behind and to travel light offer a metaphorical framework for the three days of Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil. These three days are three days but they're not. It's one liturgy we enter, we pause from, and then we re-enter. Words typically outweigh actions in our Sunday services. However, conversely, dramatic rituals, actions, and tangible objects used in the Triduum liturgy help the worshiping community to see them as conveyors of gospel and signs of grace. The bowl is a good example. It figures prominently in the story of the Last Supper in John's gospel as Jesus performs the duty of a slave, washing the feet of his disciples and urging them to do the same for each other. Set in the context of 
first century Mediterranean culture, the washing basin would have been a familiar sign of hospitality and hygiene. The mass. The hymn, These Holy Days Enfold Us Now, from our new supplemental hymnal, All Creation Sings, is a setting of a Dolores Duffner text. You may recall the tune from a time when it was set to When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's sing these two verses as we move into the Triduum, beginning with our Maundy, Maundy Thursday liturgy. Thursday liturgy is the door or the threshold to the three days. It signals the conclusion of the Lenten season by providing the absolution that had been promised during the Ash Wednesday liturgy at the beginning of Lent. In addition, this liturgy represents and commemorates what occurred in the upper room that night when Christ was betrayed and taken captive. The mood of this liturgy is a fascinating mixture of emotions. Because of the gift of absolution and the institution of the Lord's Supper, Christians feel gratitude and no joy. Because of the profound example of humility and service given through the washing of feet, Christians feel deeply moved and no awe. Because of the treachery of Christ's arrest, Christians feel intense regret and no anguish. This type of liturgy from Monday Thursday derives from the efforts of the fourth century in Jerusalem to recall and repeat the events associated with, with Christ's death and resurrection. In the beginning, this celebration was originally observed in Golgotha. The celebration of Holy Communion provided the primary focus of the day. Additional liturgical practices were subsequently added. The addition of foot washing was added in the late seventh century to commemorate Christ's mandate, mandatum, hence the name Monday, Thursday, that Christians be servants of all. Also added very early was the reconciliation of the penitents by means of absolution. The repentance expressed during the Ash Wednesday service is given profound response through the forgiveness of sins offered on Monday, Thursday in the laying on of hands. Oops. That didn't work. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Another aspect to consider is the end of the liturgy itself. Because this liturgy is the first part of a unified liturgy extending through the through the Easter vigil, a benediction is not given on either Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday but is delayed until the vigil of Easter. The medieval practice in 10th century England was to strip the altar so that it might be washed for the next Eucharist of Easter. This becomes spiritually allegorized into the stripping of Christ and dispersal of the frightened disciples. In our tradition, Psalm 22 is sung during the stripping of the altar. The haunting words that open this Psalm, my God, my God, articulate the paradoxical alternation of complaint and trust, praise. 
the ritual removal of liturgical vessels, parents, and adornments can hint, hint to the next days what could be left. The hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, is most often used as the hymn of the day on Good Friday. The text dates to a poem, possibly by Bernard of Clairvaux from the 15th century, that addresses each portion of Christ's body on the cross, the feet, the knees, the hands, the side, the breast, the heart, and the head. In the 17th century, Paul Gerhardt prepared a German version of this hymn. The tune known as the pa Passion Chorale was used extensively by J.S. Bach in five of his cantatas and five times in the St. Matthew Passion alone. We'll sing just the first verse of this hymn as we move into the Good Friday portion of the Triduum. Good Friday commemorates the passion and death of Christ. The earliest annual commemoration of the crucifixion was in the second century when Christ's death and resurrection were commemorated in a unitive festival known as Pasha. Two third century documents give testimony to the common practice of the early Christians of fasting on the Friday and Saturday that precede the Paschal Vigil. However, it is not until the fourth century in Jerusalem when the first liturgical celebrations of the Passion of our Lord were held. A whole day was allotted for prayer. A processional was held to Golgotha that included the reading of Passion narratives and prayers. <clears throat> At Anu's Day, we gather for a service of the shadows or tenebrae. The service of lessons is accompanied by the gradual extinguishing of lights. The gospel read on Good Friday does not vary with the three years of the lectionary cycle. It is always the passion according to John. John's passion account testifies to our understanding of the Triduum's unity. John does not tell a story that would leave us in mourning. This gospel understands the suffering and crucifixion are the revelation of God's love and glory. The loud noise after the gospel reading is complete reminds us of the stone rolled in front of Jesus' tomb. The concluding silence gives us opportunity for reflection and prayer. This liturgy is a continuation of Maundy Thursday and will continue and conclude with no benediction until the Easter vigil. There's no invocation at the beginning, no dismissal at the end. The Vigil of Easter. The Vigil of Easter is the oldest celebration in the church year and was the original way that the church celebrated the, res the resurrection in an annual observance. In its present structure, the vigil dates to the early second century. Jewish roots are not forgotten. Not only is the date for Western Easter set in relationship to Passover, 
but throughout the Triduum, the metaphors proclaiming Christ's resurrection are grounded in the experience of Israel. The best way for anthropologists, I read, to understand what Christians mean by liturgy would be to attend a vigil. Way back then, Jesus died and rose, and here we are, the present church, awaiting the final victory. What are we to do in the meantime? Well, we light God's lamp in the world's darkness. We listen to the great stories of faith. We baptize and we welcome new members and we share in the holy meal so that our life in the world outside these events is renewed. The vigil is filled with primordial symbols, light and darkness, fire and water, bread and wine, and then with dramatic transitions from darkness to light from death to new life, from bondage to liberation, from fasting to the great Eucharistic feasting. Vigil contains four parts, light, readings, baptism, and Eucharist. The vigil begins preferably outside in darkness. A light is struck, not a single match, but a bonfire, a new fire for a new year. The service of light focuses on the Paschal candle. Some ancient Paschal candles were six feet tall, the better to be a sign of the one who lights the world. The candles marked with the cross of Christ, the Alpha and the Omega of all time, and the four digits of the calendar year with five nails that are made with incense that mark the cross. This is one I especially learned a lot about in preparation for this. Um, we are led by the Paschal candle as if by the pillar of fire by night that God provided to the Israelites we process or we process into the church with our candles lit and chanting our thanks for the light of Christ. We're now ready to hear what is perhaps the greatest liturgical text of all Christendom, the Exalted, or also it's known as the Easter Proclamation. We call the choirs of angels to sing with us, the angels who sang at Jesus' birth, who announced the resurrection, and who surrounded the heavenly throne. These messengers of God become agents of praise to God, as if the will of God for all created things is the praise of God. I think this is something that's kind of hidden in the liturgy unless you're aware of it. And so I'm going to, what did I do? Yeah. I'm going to read a few lines from it so that you'll recognize it on that Saturday. And, and listen to the verbs, listen to the history, the references. Rejoice, now all heavenly choirs of angels, and celebrate the divine mysteries with exultation. And for the victory of so great a king, sound the trumpet of salvation. Exult also, O earth enlightened with such radiance and made brilliant by the splendor of the eternal king. Know that the ancient darkness has been banished from all the world. Be glad also, O mother church, clothed with the brightness of such a light and let this house resound with the triumphant voices of the peoples. For this indeed is the Paschal feast in which the true lamb is slain by whose flood the doorposts the door of the faithful are made holy. This is the night in which in ancient times you delivered our forebearers from the land of Egypt and led them dry shod through the Red Sea. 
This is the night. This is the night in which breaking the chains of death, Christ arises from hell in triumph. O night truly blessed in which heaven and earth are joined, things human and things divine. We therefore pray to you, O Lord, that he in whose honor this, handle, this candle burns will continue to vanquish the darkness of this night and faithfully shed light on all the human race. Watch for that on Saturday night. Because in metaphor after metaphor, the exultant gives us images of our faith, not data of our doctrine, but the metaphors for the meaning of our baptism into the Paschal mystery. This is the night, repeats the song. This night, Easter, this Easter, this year. Again, this is the night, the present, not escaped, but reconstituted in Christ. This is the night the tomb becomes a womb. Hmm. Back. You can do it this way. Thanks. The service of readings rehearses God's mighty acts in history read in and by the light of Christ. We read from the Hebrew scriptures four or seven or 12 stories <laughs> that tell us in paradoxical language, the resurrection story. Again, God created the world from chaos. God saved Noah and the animals from the flood. He rescued Isaac from death. He freed the people of Israel from slavery and God puts flesh on dry bones and he stands with the three men in the fiery furnace. The services of holy baptism follows as the third part of the Easter vigil. The congregation is led by the Paschal candle to the font and in our church we move from outdoors into the community room to the nave and then eventually to the sanctuary. So there's a lot of movement involved. The congregation is led by the Paschal candle to the font. And since at least the beginning of the third century, vigil has been the primary time to celebrate baptism. The bowl reappears and serves as a marker for both an entrance rite and a fundamental shift in roles. Again, People are being cleansed and assuming new identities in Christ. Congregation once again is led by the Paschal candle into the brightly lit sanctuary singing, this is the feast. The climax of the vigil is the first Eucharist of Easter and the sacrament in which the risen Christ is present in bread and wine. Just a final invitation to see with new eyes this holy week. Um, it's a time when we can treasure the historical links to the ancient church. Many of these liturgies coming from the second, third, seventh century and we can appreciate how today's liturgies are grounded in the Passover. We've mentioned a number of events uh, from the Old Testament that are included in the liturgies. Recall that next week, recall that week, the significance of liturgical colors, of the pyramids, of the bowls, of the candles, of the bread, and the wine and the water. And finally, watch and listen for the paradoxes and the metaphors that can bring new understanding and new insights for the meaning of our baptism into this Paschal mystery. Any questions?
boring, huh? No. No, I'm, I'm, I say that because I really, I'm excited for Holy Week for a change. Um, for me, it was just kind of routine. I went to all the services, but I'm going to be looking for new things, new symbols, new words this year, and I hope this has helped you to do the same. Thank you. 